Welcome back everyone. For today's video, we are going to be taking a look at the third round of the 45th Chess Olympiad, which is being held in Budapest, Hungary. Now today we have the five-time world chess champion, greatest player in the world of chess, Magnus Carlsen in action. He did skip the first two rounds, and in fact, skipping the second round did prove quite costly to Norway's chance of getting a medal because they were only able to tie with Canada 2-2 yesterday with Johan Sebastian Christensen losing on board one to Sean Rodriguez Lemieux. So, Magnus in action today. Norway is playing against Colombia. After that draw in the second match, they get a slightly easier pairing. Now, we're going to start out with the game, which starts with the move E4 here being played. And now Magnus plays his move C5 after an 11-minute think. Now, you think 11 minutes, what's going on? Now, I have not actually kept up with the exact news of what happened, but Magnus Carlsen actually had an issue with getting into the playing site. He was not wearing his player's badge, and one of the journalists, Maria Emilianova, was able to get him in, and he was just in time because if he had arrived at the board more than 15 minutes late, it would have been an automatic forfeit, and Magnus would have gotten a big zero on board one. Now, even if that were to happen, Magnus' rating would be unaffected by a forfeit. But nonetheless, that would probably destroy Norway's chances of competing for medals. All right, so let's jump into the game. So we get E4, C5 from Magnus after 11 minutes. Fortunately for Magnus, 11 minutes in a slow game, not a big deal. We get the move knight to F3, and now Magnus plays move E6. We get D4, takes, takes, and we have the move A6. Now, when Magnus plays A6, this, this is what is known as the classic con Sicilian variation, where you put the pawns on E6 and A6 before deciding whether to move your knights to F6, C6, or other squares. So, here we get the move C4 from Pantoja Garcia. Magnus plays knight F6, knight C3, and we get the move queen C7. Now, here the move bishop E2 is played, and this move is actually considered to be a little bit dubious in this position. Here, what I would say is that normally what white should play is the move A3, and this, in fact, is what Ali Reza Faruja, the wonderkin from Iran, now representing France, played against me in the final game of the 3 plus 1 portion of the Speed Chess Championship. Generally speaking, after A3, white has an advantage. Now, there are many sharp lines here, like knight takes pawn, temporarily sacking a knight with queen to e5 i myself have actually won this position from the black side against none other than wesley so who represents the united states as well but if you know the theory white is supposed to be much better sorry actually the move was bishop d3 queen d4 um, and after bishop e3 queen to e5 and f4 queen c7 and queen h5 white should have the advantage all right now in this game we got the move bishop to e2 it's not dubious necessarily but it's not the best or most critical variation Magnus now plays the move b6. We get the move castles, bishop to b7, and here Magnus is already trying to win the pawn on e4. Pantoja Garcia plays the move f3, and now Magnus goes knight c6, and here we get the move knight takes knight. At this point, white has a decision to make. Do you trade the horses? Do you move your horse back to c2 or b3? Or do you try to overprotect with bishop e3? If you were to play a random move like, say, a3, you actually would lose the game instantly after the trade of the horses and bishop c5 simply winning the queen on this diagonal. So we get knight takes knight. Magnus takes with the bishop. We get the move queen d3. And here he plays this move h5. Now, I love this decision from Magnus because this is a move that imbalances the situation. I was actually doing live commentary of this game on my kick channel at the time. And I thought already here it would be difficult for Magnus to win because white's plan is pretty simple. White wants to bring the bishop to e3, put the rooks on d1 and c1, and ask black, how are you going to create counterplay? Because both the pawn pushes on b5 and d5 are very difficult due to the pawns in the center. But when Magnus plays h5, already white has to make some decisions here in terms of what you are playing for. And specifically, you have to decide. Do you want to let this pawn get all the way to h4 and h3? Do you want to play f4, for example, and play for e5? You have to make decisions. If you were to play bishop e3, for example, already here there's bishop d6 as in the game, and after the move f4, now Magus goes for knight g4 immediately. You will, of course, notice that the valuation part gives white an advantage, but the imbalance in the position, the inability to have like a very simple, straightforward plan where you can only consider one or two moves already means that Magus is in his element. And that actually, I would say, is one of the, that's kind of the soul of chess when you're playing someone who's a little bit uh, lower rated, is you want to get them in a situation where they have to consider multiple moves, multiple options, because the chances of making a mistake are much greater. Now, we also saw this in Levy's tournament recently, where in many of his games, his opponents only had one or two moves to consider. The plans were very straightforward and pretty obvious. And that's actually why he struggled very mightily in the event. All right, so we get knight g4. Magus' opponent plays move e5 here. We get the move bishop to e7. And now we have this move bishop d4. 
Here, Magnus plays the move d6, and this move is a move that I absolutely love because what he's aiming for is after takes, takes. Now the bishops are on the two diagonals here. You can bring the rook to the center, put massive pressure towards the bishop and the queen. And already here, it was very abundantly clear to me that Magnus' opponent was struggling. Feeling the Magnus effect, he's spending way too much time, he's uncomfortable, and he immediately makes a mistake with this move, bishop f3. So we get bishop f3. Magnus now trades the bishops on f3, and we get the move castles here. This is a move that I don't, I don't know if the computer loves it, actually. I think here already computer would have preferred castles. But keep in mind, from Magnus' standpoint, he's playing someone significantly weaker than him. You don't want to go into something that, that can become very complicated. For example, it doesn't work, but let's just say white could play knight d5, and you go here, and there's like a rook c1 or a queen a6. All of a sudden, white has this massive attack on the queen side, and you just don't want to end up in a tactical skirmish. You want to keep it positional, and if you keep it positional, sooner or later, your opponent is most likely going to blunder. And if they don't, well, they're just probably underrated. So we get castles. Here we have knight e4 being played, and now Magnus plays the move queen takes c4. Here, white should have played the move b3, but I assume that Pantoja... Pantoja Garcia was probably afraid of bishop c5, takes, takes, king h1, and rook d8. He probably thought, well, now I can't play like rook fd1 because of knight f2 winning the game. Their idea is like rook d3. I don't really want to have to play h3. And he probably just started feeling the Magnus effect, and that's why he went knight e4. After knight e4, Magnus correctly grabs the pawn on c4, and now we get the move rook ad1. If white were to take the bishop here after queen takes bishop, the king is now in check, and when you move the king, you lose the horse and the game as well. So we get the move rook ad1. Magnus now plays the move bishop e7. We get the move b3. And here the game continues with queen b5. Now at this point, Magnus is up one extra pawn in the center of the board. He does have some slight weaknesses on the king's side, though. So he does have to be a little bit careful here. But if he can finish the development by bringing the rook to d8, he will win the game comfortably. So here we get the move a4. Magnus goes queen b4. And now we get the move h3. And here, knight h6 is played. Knight h6 is an excellent move. If you were to go knight to f6, for example, after takes, 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 and queen h5, white can never lose the game here. In fact, if you're playing with the black pieces, probably the best you can hope for is some kind of draw here by repetition. So we get knight h6. Also, it's worth mentioning that even though you're giving up this pawn on h5 here, if white does play this move, queen takes h5, now you have knight to f5, and out of nowhere, somehow you're losing either this bishop or this knight. If you move the bishop, you lose the horse. If you don't move the bishop, well, there's actually, I guess there's literally no way to guard it. No matter where you go, you just simply lose and end the game. And if you play knight g5 here, one last point, I trade the bishop for the knight, I take the bishop, and here I have an extra horse on d4, and it's winning as well. So, Pantoja Garcia plays the move bishop c3, and now Magnus takes. We get the move rook to d7, and here we have the move knight f5. A nice move rerouting the horse to where it guards the bishop and can also jump towards the central squares. Here the game continues with rook fd1, and now Magnus plays move rook a d8, and we get this move g4. Magnus plays move knight to h4, and now we have the move queen e2, and here we have queen takes a4. Now this is an excellent decision by Magnus, simply grabbing another pawn on the wing. White cannot take what looks like a free bishop here, because then you lose the tower on d1, and the game as well. So we get the move rook 1 to d4 here, white's trying to target the queen, rook no longer hangs here, and if you were to move the queen to say c6 for example, White can simply take the bishop on e7. Now, ironically enough, this is still losing, but the point is you have to be a little bit careful. So Magus goes queen to a3, the best move here. Queen now guards the bishop while spying the bishop on c3 here, and Pantoja Garcia plays move king h2. Now Magus trades the rooks, and here he plays the move rook d8, and this is perfect perfect understanding and technique from Magnus. Now, this might not be the absolute best way to play the position necessarily, but what Magnus knows is that if he can get into an endgame up a pawn or two pawns, he will win no matter what. And so even if it's maybe not the most precise method, if you get that endgame, you will win. And this is what we like, what I like to say is knowing your opponents, knowing your style, and knowing what will work every single time. So we get the move rook to a7, Magnus trades the pawns on g4, and now he goes knight to g6 here, attacking this pawn on f4. It may look a little bit scary here on the king's side, but if white does play f5 like in the game, now this king is very open here, and black has a knight, two pawns, and a bishop, which are all very, very close to the king for protection. So we get the move bishop d6, Pantoja Garcia goes for the move king to g1, we get the move queen c1, and now we have queen e1 being played, and here Magnus goes bishop c5, check. Pantoja Garcia plays king g2. If he were to take this bishop on c5 here, black can play rook to d1, pinning the queen on e1, and after check, king h7, takes, takes. You might be thinking, well, white has a bishop knight and a rook for the queen. 
but white is going to lose something the knight is still on pre on c5 if you play knight d3 for example i can simply take and after takes queen to e3 i win either the horse or the knight on one of these two squares so pantoya garcia goes king g2 magnus plays knight to h4 we get the move queen takes h4 and here the game ends in style after queen g1 king to f3 rook to d3 we get king e2 and now magnus plays the move queen to d1 checkmating the white king on e2 here king cannot go to f2 as the bishop covers the square and with the checkmate magnus gets a resounding victory in game number one or round number game number one for him round number three of the tournament now it's very sporting of his opponent from Colombia to play out till checkmate I suspect he did it because he's playing the greatest player in chess history probably won't have many opportunities if any to play Magnus again so I think it's just one of those things where you want to do it you'll have a story to tell your kids later on or your grandkids um, or family that you played against Magnus Carlson so he plays out to checkmate so for Magnus a pretty clean win in his first game with the black pieces nothing really too crazy about it just gets a position creates some imbalance and his opponent is not able to keep up with him all right, so Magnus gets a win in his first game, and now the next game we're going to be taking a look is being played between Anish Giri from the Netherlands and Lorenzo Lodici from Italy. Now, the Netherlands are one of the dark horses in the tournament. They do have a chance of getting the medals. You have Anish Giri on board one. Jorn Van Forest, uh, occasionally 2,700-level player, very up and down on board two. You have Max Vornerdam, somewhere around 2,630 or 2,640 on board three. And you have Erlen Lemmy on board four. So they're one of the dark horses to maybe sneak into medal contention if they can keep it going. On the other hand, Anish Giri has been having a very rough go of it recently. He struggled mightily. He lost this match to Hans Niemann, where he lost about eight feet, eight points. Uh, he struggled in the Sinkfield Cup as well, which followed that event, losing, I believe, about 15 points. And so hope, hopefully for Anish, he'll be able to get it under control in this Olympia. Now, Netherlands 2-0, Italy 2-0, matchups of Grandmasters on every board, and Anish has the black pieces in round number three. So the game starts with the move d4. Anish plays knight f6. We get c4, e6, knight c3, bishop b4, and now we have the move e3. Now, thus far, pretty standard. This is, of course, the classic Nimzo Indian defense. White has many options, e3, f3, knight f3, g3, etc. But this is a standard starting position for the Nimzo Indian. So we get e3. Anish plays b6, hoping to put the bishop on either a6 or b7 here to target the pawn on c4 or the pawn on g2. Lodici plays bishop d3, Anish plays bishop b7, and now we get this move knight ge2. Now here Anish decides to go for this move, bishop takes g2, and this is sort of the start of going for chaos or complicated variations. Black could very calmly play a move like castles, for example, and if white were to castle here and you get d5, we're already very much back in the standard lines of this variation, but Anish decides to play bishop g2. He's inviting the fight, and now the game is going to become extremely double-edged. We get rook g1, Anish plays bishop f3, and now we have this move rook g3 being played. Now, you might be wondering, well, why doesn't Lodishi play the move rook takes g7? This is, of course, a move here, but after knight to h5, rook has to go back, and after takes, takes queen h4. Suddenly, you have this weakness on h2. Your knight can't move. Black has the easy development towards the queen side, and white is actually in a lot of trouble very quickly. So, Ani so Lodici plays rook g3, Anish takes the knight, we get takes, and now we have the move bishop to e4 being played, and here the game continues with queen c2. Now, you will have noticed that Anish is down on the clock, and this is one thing that I've talked about a lot in my live streams. I'm not sure if I mentioned it in my recap so much, but Anish Giri's greatest strength in chess from having played him over the past decade plus is his opening preparation. Anish has had great openings. Generally, I would say better than almost anyone in the world, except for maybe Fabiano Caruana. But recently, it seems like he's been struggling a lot. In the match against Hans Niemann, it felt like he was getting outprepared in the Italians that they played, the Nidorfs as well, the Sicilian Nidorf, I should say. Um, and he seemed to be struggling a lot. And now again, we're seeing in this game against Lodici, Lodici has not moved instantly, but he's clearly still in his preparation. Anish is already down 20 minutes on the clock. And to me, if Anish no longer has this greatest strength of his, which is the opening preparation, if he loses that, it's going to be very hard for me to see a future where he's going to be competing at the absolute top level. So we get takes, takes. Anish plays the move knight h5. We get the move rook h3. And now we have the move g6. And here Lodici plays e4. Now, this is a very scary situation because, as you can tell from the clock, Lodici is still moving instantly. He is making instant moves. This is all preparation. And Anish is up a pawn on g6, but there's a big white center here. White can play f4 or knight g3. You also have some weak dark squares around your king. And it's very, very tricky to play this position. So Anish goes d6. We get the move knight to g3. Knight takes knight. And now we have queen takes knight. And here Anish plays the move f6. Again, up to this point, as you can tell, every move coming in instantly. So we get f6, and now we have this move bishop h6 being played after a 20-minute thing. And this is where the game starts fresh. Now, the problem here for Anish 
is that when he plays f6, what he's really hoping for is he's hoping his opponent is going to sack the queen, go for a meme idea, and we end up in a situation like this with even material. But black is actually better here due to these weak pawns on c4 and c3. Let's say bishop e3, king e7. I'm just going to make some random moves like a3 here, king d3, and rook h8. And with the weak pawn on c4, the weak pawn on h2, black is much better. Lodici, understanding the positional structure here, plays move bishop h6. And at this point, I already started to have a very bad feeling for Anish because not only is he down 20 minutes on the clock, but much like I mentioned in the Magnus game here, the problem with the situation is that Anish has to be precise. And for his opponent, there are really not a whole lot of things to look at. If we look at this position, White has made a lot of sacrifice. White has sacrificed a pawn on G2. White has a compromised pawn structure with these double pawns on C4 and C3. So if White doesn't do something on the G or the H file or break the center open immediately, White is going to simply lose. So because of that, White doesn't really have a lot to think about here. And when you're in such a situation, it becomes very difficult to play when you have to find the ideas and your opponent, especially when they're a weaker player, has easy moves. So Anish plays the move rook g8 here. This is a move that he plays simply because if he were to play a move like, let's just say, knight c6, white can go bishop g7, attacking the rook. And after rook g8 and rook takes h7, now you're going to lose the pawn on g6, and everything is simply collapsing. So Anish goes rook g8 to stop bishop g7, and now Lodici plays this move e5. Now this move is an excellent move. The problem is that this is not a hard move to find because, as I mentioned, White has basically made huge sacrifices. If you play d5, for example, after e5, now the center of the board is very closed, and this bishop on h6 is staring at an open diagonal. So e5 is a very thematic move because you open up the long diagonal towards this rook on a8, but you also open up this diagonal towards the queen on d8 as well. So it's a multi-purpose move, and it really is simply opening up the position immediately. So Anish goes knight d7, and now we get the move castles here. Another move that's not super difficult for white to play. Your king is in the middle. It makes sense to castle because you really don't ever have any ideas of attacking on the queen side here. And, and so if you don't have ideas of attacking on the queen side, then trying to play in the center of the board immediately makes a ton of sense. So Anish goes queen e7, and now we get pawn takes pawn, knight takes, and again, we have another pretty straightforward move, which is bishop g5 pinning the knight on f6 now at this point as you can tell from the valuation bar white is a little bit better but without knowing that it's only a little bit better it's very easy to lose control and anish will lose control as we're about to see the way that you're supposed to play this according to the computer is to play rook f8 and after queen to h4 it's very important that you do not castle because after rook to f3 this pin is deadly if you move the queen you lose the horse you can't move the horse without doing a botez gambit and so if you lose the horse you lose the game Computer says here you can play the move h6, and after takes, castles, and rook to f3, apparently after rook to f7, white is only slightly better. If you play queen g6, there's rook g8, I guess, queen h6, and this move knight g4, and somehow the glue is holding together, but it's very hard to go for this because unless you calculate it perfectly, already here you think that you're probably close to losing. Say you go rook f8 and white gets h4, this pin is still absolutely deadly here, and you think you're just simply lost. So Anish ends up playing this move knight to e4 pretty quickly, I think it is. And this move is simply a blunder that loses the game on the spot. Lodici takes the queen, we get takes, and here the very important move f takes g3 is played. Now, most of the time in chess, you're told to capture towards the center, i.e. towards the d and the e file, so you want to capture it with the h pawn. But here, taking with the f pawn is simply the best move for two reasons. First of all, what I think Anish missed, of course, I have no idea of knowing without having spoken to him, is that I think Anish probably thought he could take and go king to f6, check, and king g5 here. But after rook to f4, the black king is simply caught in a mating net here. No matter what move you play, I can pre-move this move h4, and the king is simply checkmated. You can't go to either the h file or the f file here because the rooks stop the king from moving. So this is one theory that I have that Anish maybe thought this, this wasn't possible. The other theory I have is that maybe Anish thought that at this point in the game, if he didn't play knight e4, if he, if he were to play rook f8, queen h4, and h6, or any of these lines, that he was simply lost immediately, and he, he just couldn't work out the lines. And he's obviously not a 3,500 computer, so he decided why not just try to go for an end game. So I don't know which one of those theories is true, but nonetheless, he ends up in this position. But the big issue with this or actually the big issue, or the second point I was going to make about why fg3 is right, is that if you were to take, and you get to this position with hg3, um, takes, check, king f6, for example, there's no f file to check on. If you take, and we get rook c8, black is simply completely fine here. Um, but also in this position after takes, since you can't go here, you go to d8. Now in the end games, if you are ever able to win this pawn, I'm just going to set up a specific position here, 
uh and i'll just make some moves if you ever win this pawn on g6 you always are going to end up with two connected pass pawns going up the board and if you get the two connected pawns you win the game so we get rook takes so we get this position after fg3 king e7 takes king d8 and now we have this crushing move rook to f1 being played and the problem is here for Anish that his opponent's moves Lodici's moves here are not difficult White simply wants to stack of two towers on the seventh rank creating castle mania and Anish here is just lost he has nothing at all that he can really do so we get king c8 we get the move rook to f7 king b7 takes and he goes king a6 actually I do want to point out one other thing which is that if black were to play a move like a5 for example after rook f7 rook to a7 and now h4 in the long term let's just say a4 and rook g7 we're headed for this end game where white is going to win this pawn on g6 and with the two connected pawns going up the board white will win very easily so we have this position after king a6 Lodici now plays rook to e7 another excellent move here the main issue for Anish being this rook on a can never come into the game because if you ever move it rook takes a7 is simply checkmate so Anish is playing without a rook here he's kind of hoping that with one rook it's almost like playing with one arm tied behind your back with this one rook that he can somehow create enough play but as we're about to see it is nowhere near enough so we get the move rook to f8 here Lodici plays king b2 important move by the way because if you were to take and you get some position like rook f2 at least temporarily the white king is cut off on the back rank and if you were to further take on d6 now black has rook to e8 threatening the ladder checkmate with rook to e1 here and if you play the move king to d1 now I can actually make a draw with rook e2 and I will just check your king forever no matter where your king goes and there's simply no way to escape regardless of what you do so here Lodici plays king b2 which is a great move because now you'll never get the king cut off on the back row Anish plays d5 and after rook takes e6 d takes c4 and rook takes c4 Anish Giri simply turn tips his king or not yet actually plays rook f2 king b3 and Anish tips his king and simply resigns this game here now this is a shocking loss for Anish it's probably one of the worst losses I've seen the loss in the Singfold Cup weren't great the Hans loss wasn't great but here he's playing at someone rated nearly 200 points lower than him and he just gets blown off the board out of the opening now I don't know what's going on with Anish's opening preparation it seems like he's struggling in many of these games lately it could just be a bad run everybody has issues with their form but it's been quite a while now and even beyond having been quite a while Anish's rise and fall in recent times really signifies why chess is so difficult as a professional player because just six months ago Anish was around the top five in the world and after this loss day, day to Lorenzo Lodici he is now down to number 25 in the world which is outside the top 10 now he's not going to get invitations to Grand Chester and he's probably going to have to start playing some open tournaments to try to build his rating back up and if he's unable to perform in the open events it's very unlikely that he's actually going to end up back at the elite level and it really it's kind of been a deja vu for me because I remember when I did the recap after Anish beat Hans I think on day one and I said he had just re-entered the top 10 and it's just amazing to see how just one month of bad chess can totally ruin um ruin ruin your rating and potentially all the invites and a season's worth of income for the player so very very tough loss for Anish with this loss um Italy would go on to defeat the Netherlands in a big surprise they would beat them by a score of three to one with Anish losing Max Vornerdam losing and Erwin Lamy losing Jordan Fan Forest would win on board too, but the Netherlands lose three to one. I don't want to say this kills their chance of meddling, but their chance of finishing in the top three now become very, very difficult and very unlikely as well. So tough loss for Anish. I hope that he can pick up and find a way to get back and form this Olympiad at least, because if he's if he doesn't, there's a chance he could be outside the top 30 by the end of the event. So we see Magus being Magus. Anish unfortunately struggling but a lot of wild stuff going on I do want to point out that Anish was not the only strong 2700 plus GM to lose today in a shocking upset Vincent Keimer from Germany also lost his game in the match between Germany and Lithuania now I don't know if Germany will be able to tie that match but as of right now it looks as though Germany is also going to be upset so three big upsets in round three are going to be France losing to Montenegro Germany losing to Lithuania and of course Netherlands losing to Italy so on that note I hope you guys have enjoyed my recap from the third round of chess Olympiad being held in Budapest Hungary if you're not already subscribed to the channel make sure that you smash that subscribe button below and we'll be back with great recaps from the rest of the event very very soon see you guys have a good one bye